We're coming in hot with inspiring guests, witty banter, and colorful commentary for today's veterans and military community. This is the Tango Alpha Lima Podcast. They call me crazy cause I'm facing all my giants They try to scare me into thinking I can't fight it They tell me I should never even think of trying But that's just me, I'm gonna live out in defiance Welcome to the Tango Alpha Lima Experience I'm Jeff Daly of the Michigan Dailies And here beside me, in new surroundings Is Ashley Marie Gorbulja Maldonado what do you think of the digs? That's uh, it's, it's pretty good. All it's right. pretty good. If you're wondering where we are, <laughs> we're at the Hollywood Legion Theater at American Legion Hollywood Post 43 in Hollywood. I think I got Hollywood in three times. That's amazing. So we're here today because Ashley was in town, and we're recording here today. And this is great because this episode comes out the day after Memorial Day, the day after uh, the Indy 500 race, and where the American Legion IndyCar Series partnered to present to the world the Be The One vehicle and the Be The One campaign. What does that mean? So Be The One is pretty much what we can do as individuals to help and reach out to someone in need, whether that's a phone call, like the buddy checks that we do, here at the Legion, that's just, you know, being kind or however you interpret that, right? So being the one is our way of, of reaching out to one another in a, an act of camaraderie and uh, mutual helpfulness. I mean, they have a they have kind of a mantra thing, like what's the one thing you can do to be the one mm -hmm. to save one? Right. And we're gonna ask our alphas to, to march in force in the community, what can you do to be that one person for one other person. And let's, uh, let's help each other out at the best way that we can as one team. And uh, as we say, we say one team, one fight this year in California for uh, Commander James, that's been his mantra. And it kind of just really works in. And this partnership between the American Legion and IndyCar Series is doing more than just more than just putting up a great race team. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to spoil it for you if you don't know who won. So, yeah, I'm just going to, you know, the people that record sporting events? Yeah. And they're like, don't talk about it, don't talk about it. Spoiler so, alert. Yeah, we're not going to spoil anything <laughs> for you. But we will say that it's more than racing. Mm. It's about humanity here, and it's about keeping our brothers and sisters alive. So yes. be the one, Alphas, be the one. <laughs> All right, we're going to get into this show. Uh, let's start out with the topic, Ashley. All right, so you want to pronounce you want to pronounce this gentleman's name? Oh, our our be the one driver, Tony Kanan. Kanan, Tony yeah. Kanan. So, Tony Kanan uh, and fellow indie drivers Jimmy Johnson and Alex Palou are representing the American Legion for the second consecutive season. Each driver is doing more for the American Legion this racing season than just wearing the gear and steering the sponsored cars. So, with that all being said, you know, prior to this season, each of the drivers were given, you know, ex exclusive interviews with the American Legion. Uh, Johnson has, has talked about his grandfather's service in the military and uh, assorted other topics, while uh, Apollo has discussed uh, what it means to be living in America, fitness, and more. So it's a really diverse range of topics, and we're really just, you know, pivoting to educate uh, the public on the role of uh, the American Legion's Be the One initiative. So, which and this is really cool because mm -hmm. uh, this is like an interview style article, but he also wrote an article mm -hmm. for AP. Yeah. This partnership is really getting us some great exposure on a most important topic. He wrote an essay for the AP that's really personal. It talks about his motivations uh, for, for continuing to race, for mental health, for both uh, people in sports and for uh, veterans and service members. So it's a really great piece in mm -hmm. the AP. Super producer Holly, who I'm looking at in front of me on a screen right now, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, she's gonna make sure that you know where to find this information. And 
I mean, this mental health thing, it's gripping the nation. It is, it has never been more important than it has been just as, um, you know, the world is enduring a lot of, a lot of tragedy and a lot of hardship and just not knowing how to navigate this space. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things happening in our, our children, the children in youth space that, that need attention, right? And I think that this overarching campaign really is, it's going to touch everyone, not just the veteran community, but I'm hoping that it inspires others to, to step up and step out to, to be that person somebody needs in their lives. So, um, like I said, the world is a, it's an interesting place right now. And I know that us as Legionnaires, we will continue to rally together, um, united to, to help our brothers and sisters. Yeah, it's true. And it's great that these guys are coming out because mm -hmm. yeah. uh, people look up to them, which takes a lot of the stigma away of getting help mm -hmm. in the mental health space. And uh, believe it or not, people look up to you. Somebody looks right. up to you. So if you're that one talking to somebody, you could have a really big impact. So uh, mm -hmm. I hope we can I hope we can band together and get out there and do what's best for the community. But really, individually, if we can just do that best for the person in front of you, the person on the other end of that phone, then we've done our job. All right. So be the one that's amazing. But we have other stories to get to. Today, we have a great guest. All right. Today, we're going to be joined by Sebastian Younger. Is it Younger or Junger? I, for, I mess it up every Younger. time. Younger. He's, no, Holly's shaking. No, She's Younger. thumbing it up. OK. Uh, she does a pantomime thing. I wish you guys could see it. <laughs> we need to do a behind the She's scenes like... of Holly. Um, <laughs> Well, Sebastian's the number one New York Times bestselling author of The Perfect Storm, mm -hmm. Fire, Death in Belmont, War, Tribe, and Freedom. He's also an award-winning journalist and contributing editor to Vanity Fair and a special correspondent at ABC News. He has covered international major news stories around the world, which is what international means. Junger is also a documentary filmmaker <laughs> whose debut film, Restrepo, which we both have seen and loved, mm. a feature-length documentary co-directed with the late Tim Hetherington, was nominated for an Academy Award and won the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. Uh, Junger's newest initiative, Vets Town Hall, where he is founder and director. We'll be back to talk to him about all of this and probably more as Ashley peels back the onion right after the break. National Commander Paul Dillard recently announced the start of the third annual 100 Miles for Hope campaign. And I'm excited to announce this year that the American Legion Riders have special incentives and we've even made this campaign easier to track this year. This year we have three tiers for this program, both for individuals and for chapters. For individuals, for every $100 donation, you'll receive a signed certificate from the National Commander. For, do for a donation of $250, you'll receive a special coin from the National Commander. And for donations of $500 or more, you'll receive a special plaque signed by the National Commander. For American Legion Riders chapters, for a donation of $500 or more, you will receive a special certificate signed by the National Commander and by me as the American Legion Riders chairman. For, for $1,000 or more, you will receive a special plaque signed by me, the American Legion Riders Chairman. And for $1,500 or more, you will receive a special plaque signed by the National Commander. Now that you know about this program, we hope that you'll visit legion.org slash 100 miles to learn more about the program and to learn how you can help us raise much needed funds to benefit disabled American veterans and their children. God bless, be safe, and I hope to see you on the road. All right, we are back here with Sebastian Younger, and I'm going to go uh, unprofessional for a minute. Uh, I saw on your page you were a documentary filmmaker for Restrepo, and I remember this, and I remember it very distinctly because I wanted to see that movie, and it wasn't in big theaters, so my friend and I went to a boutique theater, if you will, 
And I'm watching this movie and it was, it's, I'll just say this. If you are out there and living and breathing, you need to see this movie. But um, I was watching it in the discomfort and the chaos and the, and the, just the, the terror in some of these people's eyes. And I'm watching it on a leather couch with a co- like a side table with my beverage on it. And I just felt so guilty. But the impact of that movie is phenomenal. So I just wanted to, I might give you a second to talk about that before we really get into, uh, and Ashley typically asks the first question, but I'm going to take a fanboy privilege because that movie is one of my tops. I thank you very much. It was my first documentary film. My buddy, Tim Hetherington and I, uh, um, shot all the footage for it. We were uh, in the Korangal Valley with one platoon at a remote outpost called Restrepo uh, in eastern Afghanistan. There was a lot of combat. We um, we either did trips together or alternated trips. We got hundreds of hours of footage of life in this remote outpost. We wanted to make a film that simply portrayed what it's like to be an American soldier. We didn't try to evaluate the war pro or, or, uh, or con. We didn't, uh, no big strategy, no ambassadors, no generals. Only the guys at that outpost were in the film. And uh, we won the um, grand jury prize at Sundance, which was a shock. And, and then we were nominated for an Oscar. And a few weeks after we were on the red carpet, uh, my friend and brother and colleague Tim was killed in Misrata, the city of Misrata in Libya, covering the civil war in Libya an assignment I was supposed to be on and last minute I couldn't go. And, um, you know, it's left me with a, a really a lifelong sort of um, residue of, uh, of guilt and, um, and real, real pain about, about that. The, the transition from the Oscars to uh, him being dead was um, absolutely ghastly. Right. Because he was making a, a similar project, right? Like embedded in the middle of everything because uh, that film it op- I mean, if I'm remembering it properly, there's a big explosion at the, towards the beginning. Yeah, I was, I was in a Humvee. Yeah, I was in a Humvee, and I luckily I had the camera rolling, and we hit an IED, and so we got. I don't think there's too many shots of this of an IED going off from inside the Humvee itself that's getting hit, uh, and it went off under the engine block. Uh, so we were spared whatever might have happened to us. We were spared, but it it sort of tore up the front of the Humvee and and then a firefight started. The Humvee was on fire. We got out, you know, it was it was pretty dramatic. The film starts with that. Um, and uh, Tim Tim shot equally dramatic footage as well. We were both in a lot of combat and had a lot of downtime. And and we and the viewers of the film get to know the the 20 or 30 guys at this outpost uh, extremely well throughout the course of the film. We thought of the film as a 90 minute deployment. That's how we sort of conceived of it in our minds. And I, I, I think you were successful. So uh, there we go. I'll probably talk to you about this at some point in the future, uh, but we have a show to do. So well, <laughs> it's not all about me, Ashley. Well, Jeff, I, I will have to say, so I'm kind of glad you went fanboy before I went fangirl. So the story also about Restrepo, I had an opportunity and, and Sebastian, I don't know if you recall this, this gentleman, I think he was a staff sergeant at the time. Um, Mark Patterson. Oh, Pat- Patterson. You yeah, know, Patterson. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I had a very unique privilege of meeting him while I was at the University of Akron. He was one of the ROTC cadre. Oh. And when he was assigned, I think I was in like my first year and I was also really involved with our student veterans um, organization and, you know, advisors on campus, as well as create American Legion Post on campus. So there was a lot of this intersect of Oh my gosh, wait, you're, you're the guy who had to make the call about the cows and and the Restrepo. And it was just this hilarious moment where like all of the cadets, everyone on campus, like found out that, you know, now master sergeant Mark Patterson is like this, the star who made that, that cow, the the cow call. Right. Um, So that was like my, my first response uh, or, you know, moments I got to like share with that and then I watched Restrepo with a bunch of friends and then I was like wow this is really good um but that is my little caveat story to meeting one of the folks that you've had a privilege of you know documenting uh documenting excuse me but yeah it was uh Uh, fantastic yeah he was the platoon sergeant one great guy really great guy (laughs) really calm under fire and, and just 
fantastic, fantastic soldier. So I'm glad you got to meet him. That's that's great. Yes. That's the magic well, power. What happened was that the guys, you know, they've been eating MREs for 10 straight months and they a cow sort of wandered into their wire at this remote outpost and they killed it and butchered it and ate it as one does. And, it, you know, of course the cow belong to a local Afghan, right? And, you know, they're worth, you know, whatever, they're very valuable. And so the, you know, this guy understandably uh, approached the U.S. military, approached the command for compensation. And of course, the value of the cow kept increasing and increasing. Mm -hmm. until it was an unbelievably valuable cow, right? So Captain Kearney called it the magic cow, like it was <laughs> infinitely valuable. Oh, I called God. an ex-girlfriend that one time. It didn't work out well. <laughs> <laughs> I said, did you not hear magical? All right. So uh, this wasn't supposed to be a movie review. and But I'm sure <laughs> Super Producer Holly will find out where this is streaming and uh, provide the link. Uh, all right. So welcome to Tango Alpha Lima. Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> glad to have you here. Ashley, you want to go ahead with, I, I guess we're still calling it the first question. The first question, the first yeah. of the first questions. So Sebastian, you know, Jeff and I got to uh, see you at Student Veterans of America National Convention uh, this past January. Just to say, bravo, you were a, a wonderful public speaker and you have really, you just have such a robust talents and skills, both as a, you know, award-winning journalist and then you're your editor, you're your documentary, everything that you've done, you've kind of touched and just turned to gold. And I will say, incredibly impressed. So my first question is, as someone who's also interested in a lot of books and reading, and I'm going to wear my nerd hat for a moment, I really want to kind of dive into some of um, some of the works, some of the so works that you've, you've put together and kind of talk about, because I know you've got the perfect storm, there's fire. Um, I think it's a death in Belmont, war. Yeah tribe which i've been told tribe should be like my my number one read and i'll let you tell me if that's accurate and then there's freedom so yeah. i wanted to talk a little bit about your creative process how you got just like started uh, as as an author and which books are the most meaningful to you it's a lot of actually that's a really long first question <laughs> so you're gonna have to forgive me you answer in sections or what however you feel yeah so whatever you can remember okay so, I, you know, in my 20s, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a journalist. Uh, I, I didn't have a staff job. So I was, you know, I was trying to make it as a freelance journalist. I could not put the, I couldn't put a life, you know, a, a life together uh, professionally of that. Um, I, so I got a job as a climber for tree companies. So I was, you know, up 50, 60, 80, 100 feet in the air on a line with a chainsaw taking trees down in sections. Mm -hmm. And I got hurt doing that. And uh, as I was recovering from a chainsaw wound, I had the idea of writing about dangerous jobs, which seemed uh, overlooked and neglected in this country. And um, so I, I was living in the town of Gloucester, Massachusetts, and a, a big storm hit the town and sank a local fishing boat, the Andrea Gale, with six men aboard. And, uh, and so I started trying to write, I didn't have a contract or anything, but I started trying to write about the loss of that, the tragic loss of that boat. It became my first book, The Perfect Storm. But while I was doing that, I didn't think I had a chance in hell of publishing a book. So to hedge my bets, there was a civil war in Bosnia. And so I went there on my own. I mean, of course, I didn't have an assignment or anything. I went on my own um, to Sarajevo, which was under siege, you know, much like the situation in Ukraine right now. It was under siege by Bosnian Serb forces that were conducting the same kind of campaign that we're seeing conducted by the Russians in, in eastern Ukraine. And um, because I wanted to learn how to become a war reporter. I wanted to write about being a war reporter as another dangerous job. Uh, I had logging and a whole bunch of others lined up, but I sort of fell in love with war reporting. And so I covered wars. I was in, I was in Afghanistan in 1996 as the Taliban were taking over. I went back there in 2000. I was with Massoud in the North and Badakhshan as he fought the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. 9-11 happens. I went back and joined the com same commanders I'd been with the year before. I joined them when they overran Kabul, liberated Kabul. Um, I refused to cover Iraq. I, you know, I thought it was a mistake and I didn't think I could be objective about it. Uh, but Afghanistan, I, I, I thought an enormous amount of good could come, could come from this. It's a country that I really loved. And uh, Afghanistan was a very beautiful country. I love the Afghan people. 
I thought we can do real, real good here. Um, but, you know, obviously the war is complicated, mistakes were made. I, eventually, I thought, I got to know what it's like to be an American soldier. So I did something I never thought I would do. I grew up during Vietnam with the military, I had a very sort of complicated reputation. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I embedded with U.S. forces, and I've been in West Africa and civil wars. I've been all over the place, but I'd never been with U.S. forces. And I just fell in love with that situation. Like, I couldn't believe how amazing these guys were. And I couldn't believe I was with fellow Americans, like under fire. For me, war was also always associated with situations that had nothing to do with America. And now I'm with fellow Americans under fire. I couldn't believe it. And so I wound up doing this film and a book called War about a single deployment with this platoon in my film, uh, Restrepo. And so I, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, all, I've written, I think, six books. I love them all. It's like if I had six children, I'd love them all. They're all extremely different. Um, uh, I'm very proud of the book War. Um, I followed that up with Tribe. I realized that the struggle that many veterans have with coming home may not reflect the trauma of combat so much as the disjointed nature of our modern society. Most, For most of human history, People fought and suffered in, and survived in small groups, 30, 40 people. For 200,000 200, years, that's how humans lived. And that's basically a platoon-sized element, if you will. And so people suffered in groups, and they recovered from trauma in groups. Well, vet, American veterans are very different. They, they, they are traumatized in groups if they're in combat. Most veterans are not in combat, but the ones that are are traumatized in groups, and they recover alone because we live in a very individualistic society. Uh, and the, the data on this is tragic and all over the place that drug addiction rates, suicide, depression, anxiety, postpartum depression, on and on. They're all functions of, uh, of a lack of um, so social connection. Uh, being part of a group buffers people from virtually everything. And, uh, and, and veterans and all of Amer no, very few Americans have the privilege of being part of a close knit, quote, survival group. And, uh, and so my book tribe is about that phenomenon and what happens when a, an entire society loses their social, their immediate social bonds, you know, and then finally, and I'll finish with this finally, my book freedom was an attempt to answer the central question for me. I mean, people will clearly die for their community as we're seeing the Ukrainians do. If you are, if your country is invaded, if your hometown is attacked, people will readily risk their lives, die defending their community. It's an ancient human value, um, but they will also die to preserve their freedom, which is sort of one and the same thing in many ways. Uh, so I wanted to write a book called Freedom about about freedom and how we, um, you know, in a political sense, I, the word is misused in ghastly ways by both the left wing and the right wing. It's appalling. I completely left that out of it. I wanted to write about freedom in a more ancient sense. Uh, the way, basically, how does a small group maintain its freedom in the face of a larger, more powerful group? Uh, humans are the only species that can do that. And so I, I the book is divided, I'll end with this, the book is divided into three sections. Uh, run, fight, and think. The first thing people do, human groups do, if they're oppressed, is try to outrun their, their oppressor. Right? If you can't outrun them, you're going to have to outfight them. If you can't outfight them, you're going to have to outthink them. And, and people have done that for um, tens, hundreds of thousands of years. And freedom is about how that process works. I definitely have some, I have some reading to do. That's for sure. I, I find that incredibly fascinating. I enjoy um, studying ancient cultures and society and how, uh, how we operate in groups, sociology, psychology. Um, I, and I think it's fascinating the points that you bring up about the veteran community, because you're absolutely right. Like most of us will endure, you know, these have these experiences or endure trauma together and you're right as as we come back there is not that same network of support whether you're getting out of the service and transition you're coming back from a, a combat environment uh to you know just in in general for folks who may not have that same support group if they've never deployed right or been on active duty for like your guard reserve folks there's a a disconnect with that camaraderie i think that's a very very powerful point especially when we look at 
you know, Legion programs like buddy checks, right? Like we are calling to build relationships and remind people that we're here for them. And it's a powerful program and a tool that we use here at the Legion, um, you know, and for all of the alphas that are out there listening and, and watching, it's, I think it's important that we remind ourselves like how important camaraderie is. Um, yeah. That's my thoughts, but. Yeah. I mean, it's such a, it's such a powerful force and it's so appealing we humans clearly evolved as, as so basically as social primates to to derive their safety, uh, their emotional and physical safety from being part of a group. And if you're not part of a group, you're in danger. And uh, we all intuitively know that. So when someone retires, even they're at a very heightened risk of depression and suicide because suddenly they're on their no, they're on their own, they're in danger, and intuitively they know that. So the tip off for me is that many veterans uh, come back from service and have a mental health crisis that sort of labeled PTSD. But the truth is many of those veterans were never traumatized, right? I mean, it, what is it? A third of the military is actually under, you know, actually under fire when they deploy, something like that. So the, the trauma in itself isn't necessarily that hard to deal with. But losing your group is um, very, very dangerous, very, very complicated psychologically. So uh, Peace Corps volunteers, when they come back, are at risk of depression. They weren't under fire, but they were in part of a tight-knit community in the developing world, right, for two years. And then they come back to the great American suburb where no one knows their neighbors and no one depends on anybody, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, benefits to all of those things. But there is a core psychological issue that arises, which is you suddenly feel alienated. And when you're alienated, you get depressed and you can get suicidal. And that in some ways, it has nothing to do with the, tr the separate piece of this, which is if you were actually traumatized, as many combat veterans were, many journalists, et cetera, um, that's a whole separate thing. But you don't even need that to find yourself in psychological trouble when you come back from a deployment. This is a great chance to, uh, to transition. But first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you know something, Sebastian. I am so proud of Ashley right now. She has adopted the alphas. Uh, Welcome. That's that's what I can't stand <laughs> the word fans or listeners. So I, uh, I, I, I call them alphas and Ashley's picking it up now and I love it. Okay. So, uh, so now the demographic that hates me, will figure it out and, and take it. So uh, this, this camaraderie group thing, I will say, and this has been a, a, a mantra I've been on lately uh, because it's recently in the hospital and the Legion American Legion community is that now uh, we don't we don't take advantage of it all the time. Uh, it sometimes sits dormant and you may not actively be participating in it. But when the time arises where you, when you need it, they are there. Um, and I, I, I think that's more powerful than our I might get in trouble. I don't know. I think that camaraderie is more powerful than our programs. I said it. Right. It's uh, our programs wouldn't exist without it. So I I I, I don't think I'm going to get in trouble. But I, <laughs> I uh, the camaraderie and that group think that we have. I mean, I spend unpaid three four days a week working at my post, and uh, and it's for something, right? It's uh, it's it's for this, and the transition I'm going to make now is to your vet town hall, because I feel like uh, this kind of bubbled up from one of your books, uh, the tribe, and mm -hmm. and uh, I'm I'm not going to speculate anymore. I'm going to hear it from the man himself. Can you tell us about uh, vets town hall? Yeah, so uh, I'll lead into that by saying understand that people need community so badly that when they are forced to act in a group, such as during the Blitz of London, right, or Hurricane Katrina, any number of other disasters and tragedies, earthquakes, um, that often they will miss those terrible days later when everything's normalized, the Blitz has stopped, World War II is over, the Katrina's waters have receded, everything goes back to normal, people will miss those days of crisis because they were forced to collaborate closely with their brothers and sisters. 
and face terrible odds and overcome them together. And that is such an intoxicating experience that people will miss those days. So what I was trying to figure out is how do we create in modern American society a sense of uh, uh, shared outcome? Like we need each other, right? Even though the truth is in, an auto, in a highly technological automated mass society, we actually don't on a daily basis need each other, right? Like no one's attacking us in our homes. We get our food at the supermarket. We live in houses built by other people. We drive around in cars using gasoline that someone drilled out of the ground that we don't even know, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do you create community in a situation where people have it that easy, right? In some way, in some material ways, have it that easy, right? Um, but psychologically, they don't have it easy because we are not connected to each other. How do we produce that? So I had this idea based on a, um, a process that many Native American tribes in this country used to um, bring back warriors after, after war, after, after combat. It was called the gourd dance. So these guys would come back and you have to picture how bloody and sort of intimate combat was in those days. Uh, and uh, they would come back and they would be, uh, the community would gather and they would be allowed to sing and dance and retell their exploits on the battlefield in front of the whole community. Now that did two things. It was a cathartic um, and sometimes I'm sure boastful experience for the warrior, but it also allowed and even required that the community take moral responsibility for the combat that was happening, right? The warriors are fighting for the community. The community is there for the warriors. It's all one and the same thing, right? There isn't this awful divide where the soldiers go off and do that and we're over here and we have nothing to do with that and they come back and they don't they don't even recognize us practically as countrymen and countrywomen, right? So how that process is very, very healthy. So I had the idea of opening up town halls. Every Veterans Day, you open up the town hall and you turn on the PA system, put up a mic, and a veteran of any war who served in any capacity, you don't have to get shot at to be eligible for this, any veteran of any war has 10 minutes to tell those who are gathered to hear him or her what the experience of fighting for this country was like. Uh, if you like to say that you support the vets, which at times has been a very sort of popular, although somewhat empty phrase, if you like to say, I support the vets, well, that is that that means show up at town hall once a year. That's something tangible you can do, right? Is actually show up and hear these people out. And some of them, uh, you know, you know, sort of conservatives will be horrified by how angry some veterans are about the war they had to fight, right? And many liberals will be horrified by how proud so many veterans are about the war that they got to fight, right? And all of us are going to be uncomfortable and deservedly so, and we need to sort of be there for this. All of us will be uncomfortable when someone stands up and is crying too hard to even speak. That happens also. That's also an experience of war. And when you do this, uh, and it, what it does is it, it allows America to experience what it's like to be part of a community. At least for a few hours at a time in your town hall, you and the veterans, you all are one. And it doesn't matter if you're white, black, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat, trans, whatever, it does not matter. We're all Americans. Those people served us overseas. It's on us to bring them home because it's our war, not their war. It is our war, even if you didn't vote for it. And um, so the, the beauty of this is that A, it works. We've done it many times. The experience is incredibly powerful for everybody involved, right? Um, but it also doesn't cost anything. This is a public building. We own this building. You don't have to rent it. You just have to get the guy with the keys to open it up on a, on a holiday, right? Uh, so to, to inform yourself about how to do this, you can go to Vets Town Hall, Veterans Town Hall, Vets Town Hall, easy to find on the internet. And basically you can download the, um, the very, very simple sort of template for the rules and guidelines and what the procedure is. It's super, super simple. You don't have to be a veteran to do it either. Anyone can organize this. Uh, so I, my, my dream is that there'll be 100 in every state every, every Veterans Day. You know, imagine if it became an established thing in this country like that, how powerful it would be 
for our country as a whole. And it would also, and I'll end with this, it will also allow us to build up an oral history of American wars as experienced by the people on the ground that fought them. And that would be, you know, what a treasure, what a thing to have, what an archive to have if we could gradually accumulate that. Well, I know one post that is going to do it uh, because this sounds uh, this this sounds uh, very therapeutic for the veteran that's speaking, the veterans that are listening, the civilians that are listening, and just the and I, I think it probably helps to bring back that group atmosphere that you're talking about, mm -hmm. the shared experience thing. Uh, I'm not going to, I could talk about this forever with you, but I, I will just say that uh, the idea and the thought that you put into such a, what ends up being such a simple idea, uh, that's, that's the brilliance behind it, right? Taking something complex and finding uh, an outlet that is simple enough and that can be replicated across the country. And I, I may write a resolution that we officially endorse this kind of veteran community, uh, this town hall in the American Legion. And uh, I'm, I'm apt to write resolutions. I, I'm a nerd, but that's, that's my nerd. She has a reading nerd. I have my resolution nerd. Um, I just back brief him with Cliff Notes, Sebastian. So, so don't worry, he does get informed one way or another. <laughs> okay, no worries. No worries. <laughs> I get it live here. So Ashley, you have anything about the vet town hall or? I, yeah, I'm just more so, more so a comment. I, I think it's a, a great program. And, and like, like Jeff has said, it's, it's a great outlet because all too often you're right. There is that, that need to be cathartic together. And uh, whether it's a shared experience or just a, a deep intimate understanding, uh, of any of the emotions that one goes through. I think it's important to have people who, who get you, right? right? They may not know it all, but they, they get it. Yeah. You don't have to over explain. You don't have to, you know, put on an extra, you know, face. Um, I find that all too often in the transition and military community, there's just this expectation that you always have everything together. Right. It's just another reminder that we should continue to be kind to one another and, and show that empathy and seek understanding and, and ask questions and how uh, yep. it, it's, it's a good, it's a great platform. I, I really enjoy that. And I enjoy that. I've seen, you know, I know American Legion to, you know, VFW to even the VA, like everyone is trying some version of a, of a town hall, but this in particular, I think is great when you have in, in person folks that yep. then afterwards can connect. Right. I think there's a lot of value and, seeing yeah. people face to face, especially after, you know, everything that's been going on with COVID and really stepping into it and embracing a virtual world. What does that mean for the next generation of, of, of veterans, right? Of service members? And how are we going to continue to find that glue that keeps us together? Um, yeah. What, you know, one of the great, the many virtues of the military is that it puts the just sheer variety of Americans on display, right? I mean, it's, it's this incredible melting pot. And um, I mean, we live in a very segmented, polarized society right now in this country. I mean, so much so that I would say the polarization in this country is more of a threat to our nation than any foreign nation ever could be. We're, we are our own biggest threat to ourselves. And uh, just in terms of the, the divisions, the internal divisions that have, that have kind of been fostered by, politically, right? And, and it's very, very dangerous. And one of the things about the Veterans Town Hall is you just realize like, wow, there's no rankings of Americans. Like some people are like more American than other people. That's laughable. It's a laughable idea, right? Some people are Americans and others aren't, even though technically we're all citizens, like preposterous, right? And when you, you know, when you go to a Veterans Town Hall, not only are the people in the audience of every possible population group, right? But the veterans themselves, I mean, one of the first ones that we did, um, this woman stood up, an so older woman, you know, in her 70s, stood up and said, I mean, this totally blew my mind. I wasn't prepared for this at all. Uh, and this was in a fairly conservative community. Uh, she, she stood up and said, I fought in Vietnam as a guy. 
And then I came back and got a sex change. And the, the crowd was just like, are you kidding? Like, and it was such a great like demonstration of, wow, everything's possible. You think you know the military? You think you know this country? You think you know what men and women are? You don't. Like, it's all possible. And if we all as Americans can retain some, uh, uh, some sort of humility about our assumptions, trust me, like this country will, will, will heal and come back together. And one way to do that is to look at the just spectacular variety of people that have served this country in uniform in every possible capacity. It's like, we'll bring you to tears uh, when, you really, when you really understand that. You know who would love this? Our former co-host, now Mark National C. Judge Advocate, Mark Seavey, because, and I'm going to paraphrase because he's a lawyer, so I, I'm not going to call a direct quote, I might get sued, <laughs> but he he's known to say, you put any group of veterans in the same place doing something, therapy happens. Like you don't have to, you don't have to sit on a couch with uh, somebody holding a clipboard for therapy to happen. You just have to get these, get these uh, people together and, uh, and do something and magically therapy starts happening. And I think that that's what uh, you're doing with your vets town hall. And it's very, uh, it's very admirable thing. And I'm happy to join that revolution. And um, I'm happy to share the word. And I'm glad we're doing it here on Tango Alpha Lima because the alphas will hopefully take up this cause and Veterans Day across the land will be filled with vet town halls. Do it for us, Alphas, and let us know about it. Um, I, 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 I think, I mean, honestly, I could do a, a three-part series with, with you. You're, you're like a college professor and a, a <laughs> badass combat um, correspondent and author and smarter than me and badasser than me and uh but i'm we... so glad this is on the record <laughs> <laughs> thank you jeff <laughs> you're the only one though you're the only one that's like that so uh i thank you for being on our show today uh i i know ashley does i'm gonna, I'm gonna let her say it. i'm not gonna speak for her but um thank you for that and thank you for restrepo i i'm gonna revisit that film today and it, because it sounds like all of your work intertwines it all supports each other. The, yep. the points that are made in one support the other, foreshadow the future of this one. And I mean, it's, I hope you're super proud of it because uh, I'm a big fan. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. We, you know, we made a follow on film after Tim died, actually. We made a follow on film called Korngal, which actually might interest you as well. It's not as well known as Restrepo. It takes a look at the deployment from a different angle, but I think you'd really like it. Um, so check that out. If you're on a roll, check it out. And you might like my book, Freedom. It's a very short book. It's a two hour read. And, uh, and you, you, uh, you might, you might, uh, you might enjoy it. <laughs> you had him with a two hour read. <laughs> two hours. Wow. So, so many words. Don't worry, Jeff. I'll, I'll read it in an hour and, uh, I'll let you know. All right. Joking. But, so, uh, any, 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 any final thoughts, uh, Sebastian, that you want to leave with our audience of so many? You have to be careful what you say because it'll go viral. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I want to thank you for having me on. I'm really honored. And, um, you know, I really, my, my, my father was a refugee from two wars. Uh, from Spain when the fascists came in in 1936, and then when France, when the fascists came into France a few years later, and he came to this country. And, and he said, although he loved Europe, he said, you know, this is the, the most amazing country in the world because fascism will never come here. And we fight against fascism. And it's the land, it really is the land of the free with some, you know, with some whatever, occasional problems, right? Of course, we all know, but it, it, tr it tries to be better. We try to be better. And I really love this country. And my work, among other things, my work is sort of inevitably focused on, you know, if people read my work, will we live possibly in a better country? Like maybe. I mean, that's how I organize my thoughts around my work. So so thank you for having me on. It, it, um, we are blessed to live in an, an extraordinary time and place. And, uh, and 
we must all take advantage of that. All right, thank you so much. And for you alphas out there, I want you to relax and uh, enjoy the break and we'll be back after this. A veteran is a veteran. A veteran is a veteran. A veteran is a veteran. The American Legion embraces all current and former members of the military and endeavors to help them transition into their communities. We are veterans strengthening America. We are the American Legion. Oh boy. That was an amazing interview. Yes. So much information. I can't even I can't even come up with a summary. If you if you are joining us late, stop what you're doing, go back, listen to it again, because there was so much information there. And I, I really, really, really want to have a vet town hall right here. That would be an optimal use of space. And I really, really, really want to show Restrepo right here. I would fly back out for that. She would fly back out for I that. I would fly back out to LA to see it. That's, we gotta do it, we gotta make it happen. But before we can do that, we gotta get through this show and mm. we, don't, we don't finish the show without pew, 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 <laughs> rapid fire. It's even funnier when I'm next to her, like I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, we've got, we got a favorite topic, oh, Space boy. Force. This is from military.com. <laughs> I don't even have to read the, I don't even have to read the story. Space Force will allow neck tattoos, longer mustaches, and more makeup options for guardians. That's it. It's, the policy was unveiled Tuesday. Well, all, all things considered, wow. Um, you know, it's funny, uh, I, a member at 43, Simone and Lara, uh, she posted about this and she wrote, uh, contacting Space Force recruiting. She's currently in the guard, so she's uh, looking at looking at Space Force. She didn't get a neck tattoo, I guess. I don't know. Hey, listen, if that's your prerogative, that's your prerogative. I think it's interesting. I mean, uh, I mean, obviously, like, there's going to be what? What does it say? It was like color options for like nail and lipstick, allowing variations for women's skin tones. It's Going to allow men to wear inconspicuous concealer or foundation to cover up scars and blemishes and grants new tattoo locations, which would be your, your neck tattoos. I mean, hey, hey, listen, you know what? We're, if I'm ink, being frank. Ink in space. Ink in space. <sighs> this one. So if I, if I could, um, I, I, re I really don't have too much of an issue with this, believe it or not. I mean... Honestly, I know plenty of people with neck tattoos that are amazing, and I just don't think that we as a society should continue to judge people on like their, where their tattoos are, what their tattoos are. Like, it's just like I think we like obviously have to show some decorum. It's the military. Like, obviously, it cannot be like hateful or like you know, obviously, you know what I mean. But like, in turn, in turn, I know people with long hair fat guts that are amazing people and we still don't allow it in the military we st we still have a uniform kind of standard look what would you say to that perspective so there is a physicality portion of the job like you have to be able to do the job i will say that in my career I had some soldiers who would get taped every time and they were some of the fastest runners or they could they could do the job i think you have to look at it from like a, a uh, you have to look at it from different levels and uh, overall like what what the job is, what's the capabilities. But yeah, there's always going to be a standard. Doesn't matter what occupation you're in, what job you ho like you have. Um, I think this is just like getting in the door, opening up to folks who um, are, are interested or who otherwise may have been disqualified. Like if you're just focusing like on a tattoo, in this case, in this scenario. Um, but the description you gave is, you know, is is that physical is that physical base. So if you are not able to do the job, you're not able to do the job. But the tattoo does not prevent me from doing the job. 
Case in uh, point. Longer hair doesn't prevent you from doing the job. But alphas, we're, we, okay. we could go round and round. <laughs> uh, what do you think? Let us know. Rapid fire number, pew pew, two. All right, this one's actually really cute. This is from Task and Purpose. Um, uh, this soldier's first army mentor is two-star general sitting next to him on plane. All right, one army trainee got the basic training prep of a lifetime after boarding a plane and unknowingly sitting next to the former commander of his training location. On a flight from Germany earlier this week, a new army recruit heading to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for basic training sat down next to Major General Milford Beagle Jr., commander of the 10th Mountain Division. Beagle's previous assignment was commander of Fort Jackson and the U.S. Army Training Center. Beagle told Task and Purpose on Monday that the two started chatting when the recruit, who appeared a little older than your average 18-year-old soldier to be, asked people around him to switch seats. He was a pretty big guy, Beagle said. He's a little bigger than Beagle's six-foot, one-inch pound frame. He wasn't able to find someone to switch with, but he struck up a conversation with Beagle. He was very mannerable, Beagle said, and eventually asked a two-star general, are you in the military? <laughs> you look like, you look like you'd be in the military. And then like, huh, can you just imagine like, you know, if you're a two-star general, right, or you're a general and just general, <laughs> see what I did there? <laughs> so you're a general in general, and uh, you have had this long, amazing, fulfilling career, let's hope so, and this individual just strikes up a conversation and completely just dumbfounded by the, the I would, yeah, I don't, gosh, I don't even know how I would respond. I mean, would you know to be afraid of a two-star general yet? No, probably not. I mean... I was afraid of drill sergeants, and those were those were a different type of breed. Those that was a that was a vibe. Generals are like used to just being kind of I would imagine being doted on and having people to help them do all these things and or like avoided have some, or avoided <laughs> or avoided. And there is something there's something to be said about the genuineness of the interaction. As I was reading this story, uh, I just felt like wow, you know, it. You know, you never know who you're sitting next to. You never know, like, striking up that conversation. I, I feel like it kind of ties a little bit back into just the, like, the be the one, right? Like, you just striking that conversation and just being kind to others. And then next thing you know, you find out you're sitting next to the, the general who now is your mentor and your buddy, I guess. Who would have thought? Weird. That, that, I mean, I, I love that story. Uh, and we're not doing a rapid fire number three. Because I have a special shout out. A special shout out. Now the the media and communications that is a, a, that uh, at the national level they oversee a lot mm -hmm. of things, including Tango Alpha Lima, and right now the chairman is David Wallace. David Wallace, when uh, when I was down in on down under it, whatever, uh, he sent he meant to give me. Uh, a little gift, but he sent it via the uh, Barbara Lombrano, our com um, adjutant of California, Department of California. He sent me, look at this. This is <laughs> Marine Veterans Swear Coloring Book. Yeah, yeah. It's probably too, probably too, uh, we'll, we'll send a picture to uh, Super Drew Sally and a U.S. Marines coloring book. They come complete with lunch. There you go. Right there. Came complete with lunch. Thank you, David Wallace. That's what we call a happy meal. <laughs> uh, we appreciate, I appreciate that. She doesn't care. She's not a Marine. But um, thank you so much. And again, thank you to the whole Legion community for stepping up for this one guy. Now go out there and be the one for somebody. Do it. Do it now. All right, Ashley. So, what? Oh. oh. Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh, surprise. So. Uh, I have a shout out, and unfortunately, oh. I, I don't have this, uh, the woman's last name, but I will share with you that more recently, while I was at my post in Virginia, Vienna uh, Post 180, so shout out, uh, I was getting out of a meeting, and I came down to our club, and there was uh, an auxiliary member from Ohio, her name was Cindy, and 
she just she just stopped everything she was doing. She goes, wait a minute, I know you. And I was like, huh? And I, I saw that she had the Ohio auxiliary shirt on. And I was like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe I've met her before. She goes, no, no, no. I know you from the podcast. And I was like, what? And she goes, yeah, you're Ashley. And I'm like, I am Ashley. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I was like, I was like, really like, I had to take a deep breath. And I was like, you got, you got a fangirl. You just calm down. Cause you being a fangirl about this and this is just not how it should work. So anyway, so Cindy and I struck up a conversation. She was telling us about the show and how much she's enjoyed it. And she was like, I, I love getting the notifications and I, I love just listening to the, the chemistry and the banter that you and Jeff have. And um, so we have this brief conversation. She's just enjoying herself. And on the way out, I was getting ready and I was getting ready to get on the motorcycle. And all of a sudden I hear this car door and she runs around, she goes, wait, I have to take a selfie with you. And I'm like, okay. So I retake my, my helmet off and I've just had this crazy hair. And she's like, no, this is perfect. This is so on brand. And I'm like, that I'm crazy. It is on brand. <laughs> or that yeah, I that have is, to do it again. It's <laughs> definitely on brand. So you got an alpha shout out to yes. Cindy in Ohio. Let us know who you are. We Share need that photo. And your, your auxiliary unit, unit number. Yep. So we can shout mm -hmm. you out properly. Yes. And why don't, that's it. Let's take us let's, out of here. Let's roll with it. So, you know, don't forget to sub subscribe to Tango Alpha Lima podcast um, on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or anywhere where you are listening to your podcasts. Um, I want you to go ahead and leave us a review, right? Like we're doing some cool creative stuff. We'd love to hear your feedback. And additionally, you know, if, if you have five any stars. guest recommendations, right? She oh, yeah. Five stars. Sorry. Five stars. Very important. Rate us five stars. But I digress. If you have a guest recommendation, we want to hear from you. Please go to legion.org backslash Tango Alpha Lima and click on the suggest a guest link. We look forward to hearing from you, our alphas. All right, alphas, you you heard it here first. We need you to we need you to mobilize and uh, subscribe, comment, review, and never ever forget to be the one. That's how we started the show. That's how we'll end the show. Be the one. And with that, I'm going to declare this episode here at Hollywood Post 43, Mission Complete.